Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Chris Lee. Commodore fans, on your feet, it's time to anchor down. Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our podcast presented by Dr. Jody Jones DDS. It is part of the 440 Sports Network. Our guest today will be Seabass of WNWS. He appears on the guest line. That is presented by Michael Kendrick of the Kendrick Group. Michael is a local carpenter and a lifelong Vanderbilt fan. He builds bookshelves, cabinets, picture frames, furniture, made-to-order items. That includes a display case for my prized Dale Murphy jersey. I've seen Michael's work. He is a true craftsman. If you're in the market for custom woodwork, give Michael a call at 615-830-9458. The news presented by Stakes. Make your predictions every week on SEC Football in the Stakes app. Go to playwithstakes.com forward slash 14. Sign up with Stakes. Place your predictions. If you use the invite code SOUTHEASTERN14, when you sign up, you'll get a double welcome bonus. No cost to play Stakes ever. Our news is that Vanderbilt's got a football game on Saturday with Ole Miss. Kickoff time will be 3 Central. That game, of course, in Nashville. Now on to our interview with Seabass. It has been a minute, but our good buddy Seabass joins us from WNWS in Jackson, Tennessee. My friend has been busier than he can stand, but he said, if you can do something Saturday morning, I can come on your podcast, so that's what we're doing. I don't know that I've ever done a Saturday morning podcast, but I'm making an exception for you. Thanks for joining us, my man. Well, I sure appreciate you having me, Chris. And if it makes you feel any better, this is my first Saturday podcast as well. Yeah, well, let's uh, – goodness, we've got a lot to talk about. I can't remember – I don't think you and I have done anything since before the season. Is that right? I think that's probably right. Yeah, somewhere either that or the very beginning. Yeah, you know, no, 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 no. We 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 did something after the Hawaii game, right? Which was hard yeah. to know what we were looking at at that point. Hawaii is pretty terrible, although it did get a win against somebody or something. I can't remember who now. Yeah, Le Cordon Bleu. <laughs> that's that's about right. Um. Hey, Elon's unbeaten. There's that, for whatever that's worth. No, they're not. Uh, and then there was, <laughs> well, and then there was well, last week. And they're not. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, they were an interesting team. They were an interesting football team. Uh, yeah, I could, I could see where they, where they, where they would have a good season, no doubt. I like them a lot. And then, you know, what about Northern Illinois pushing the Wildcats a little to not yeah. the spring, but pushing them in Lexington last week. Yeah, without Lombardi too. I mean, at least at least yeah. NIU had Lombardi for what a quarter and a half, what whatever it was against Vanderbilt. Didn't have him at all against Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. And look, I I fully understand that that doesn't mean, honestly translate, you know, because every game a matchup is a matchup unto itself. But I mean, it was good to know because it was literally like what the week later. You know, yeah. So it, it, it was right after that. So it's not like, oh, they're completely different teams, you know, a whole different roster at the same time. That was seven days afterwards where Vanderbilt yeah. completely took over a football game on the road against a pretty good football team uh, and completely dominated it. That's not something we're used to seeing. And they did that. So I have to give them a lot of credit. And then there was last Saturday in Tuscaloosa. Excuse me. Yeah, in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, I don't know how to explain this. Maybe you can do it better than I can. I think that when they play a team like an Alabama or a Georgia with elite athletes, it just takes on a different level. Like, they could beat a Northern Illinois. I mean, I think they could have a fighting shot against maybe a South Carolina and a Missouri, although you're going to run into some of the same thing. I think you're going to see better athletes. They have not done well against athletes under Clark Lee. Um, the wins they have are against teams that are not composed of elite athletes. Um, and, and frankly, I've heard some disappointment, and I was a little disappointed that they didn't play better. I, 
I mean, I went into the season just saying, just get out of the Alabama game healthy, and that's all that matters. Uh, you didn't want to see a 500-yard deficit in total offense. I thought they might be able to move the ball a little bit against them. Um, what I have heard coming out of the Alabama camp is that there was a feeling that, that Vanderbilt played just to, to kind of keep it close. And I think that sort of backfired last week. But well, that that did – I mean, that, that I know it's work. Alabama. I know people know that. But that did seem to put a little damper on things in the bye week. I mean, I'm a realist. and Most of the time, I'm a realist. Uh, I hope that's not the case for this reason. Because, look, I, I, you know, I get it. I mean, and it's the start of a massive gauntlet of games. Uh, you know, which I guess this bye week is perfectly timed, to be honest with you. I get all that, but I got to be honest with you. There's the a football side of me that says, I, how could you ever have that approach in the game of football, regardless yeah. of whatever the situation? There is no legitimate situation where that would be an acceptable mindset under any yeah. circumstances. And I just... I mean, from what I've seen out of Clark, I mean, I know for the most time we think of him as a mild-mannered guy and all this other stuff, but I just can't imagine that man, that football coach, with his football mind, would say to his staff, this is going to be our approach going into Tuscaloosa, and this is how we're going to do that. I mean, maybe somebody knows something that I don't, but I can't imagine. And I, because for me, now I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, well, I think we're doomed if that was true. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get all over-exaggerated like that. But I, it would be a problem for me. I can tell you that. It, 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 would, it would be a problem for me. That's why, unless somebody heard him say it or heard them say that and showed that they said, this is what we're going to do, then I'm just not going to believe that. Yeah, they're just – I mean, I feel like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. Again, I said before the season, just get out of this game with your dignity and your health, and that's all you can ask. And I also feel like despite – I would have liked to have seen a better showing from them to feel better about where they are. But when you're so deficient on the lines of scrimmage against a team like them, and I don't know why it would be any different against Georgia – it's really hard to have the levers to push <laughs> to do a lot better. But then again, I mean, did you watch any of Kent State in Georgia, I guess, last week? I mean, no. Kent State went no, in there, and like if, if you took the names off the jerseys and just watched a quarter or two, that's a team that's probably one of the worst 20 teams in the FBS, and it went in, and it did not lack confidence against Georgia. It moved the ball. It scored points. That was, what, a 10-point game at some point in the fourth quarter, despite yeah, the fact the that Kent 30, was a 42. It was 32 to 22 in the fourth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they were – Kent was a 42-point underdog in that. And so I'm banging a lot of stuff around here, and I don't know where everything connects, but there's part of me that when I watch a game like that that says, well – you know, surely their talent isn't worse than Kent State's, you wouldn't think, at this point. I mean, I know we have made a lot about the talent needing to get better. I don't know. There's just some things to me that I'm having trouble reconciling out of I'm what sure. I've seen when they, when they beat, you know, when, when they blasted Hawaii. And again, I, I know that it's different, but like if Hawaii and Alabama play, you know, Vanderbilt wins one. You know, beats Hawaii by fifty three, loses to Alabama by fifty two. Um, is there really a hundred and five point difference between those two teams? I don't think there is. So I'm, I'm just. Uh, there could be if they wanted to. I think. <laughs> if they well, may, to. May, maybe. Look, look, maybe so. But, but you, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I just no, don't. I, I, I totally do. And yeah, and what you're saying is the absolute reason why I, I will say, and I could never accept that approach. You know what I mean? I mean, if, right. if that's the case, because you're right. I mean, look, and, and no, the question is not if, or are, are we more talented than Kent state? If you can go on the road and, and beat Northern Illinois, then you are more talented than Kent state. I mean, yeah, that's just the truth. That's just the truth. Um, 
but it looks like, I mean, and, and I don't know I, what I'm saying is n- not taking place is the way that it looked. So I, I, you, when you say that you're talking out of both sides of your mouth, no, you're not, not really because you're seeing two different things too. And it's hard to, it's, it's hard to process that, you know, and, and I'll be real interested to see where the, what this team comes out like seven days from now, because for me now, while this team physically needs the time to heal, because let's throw one other thing out there, Chris, I mean, this team's three and two, but it hasn't even been close to being a healthy football team. Uh, the, 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 the match potential team that we could put on the field, you know, if we get everybody healthy, hasn't even been remotely close to being available on game day this year. Not yet. I mean, and in key positions, key players, it could really help. So, I mean, you know, would it, would it have changed the game against Alabama as an outcome? No, of course not. Would it have been better than 55 to three? Maybe, probably, not much, but, uh, I want to see what this team's max potential is. And we're never going to find that out until some of these guys get on that football field. That's just the truth. Yeah, I would hedge some of that a little bit by saying that every team is going to have some injury issue. Again, I'm not saying Vanderbilt could not have beaten NIU if Rocky Lombardi was healthy, but it did catch a big break with him being out a week ago. And then a quarterback having to come in in the middle of the game who had not played much. But to the Vandy end of things, let's see, they played last week with like Jalen Mahoney, who in my mind is their best defensive back. They played without Miles Cecil. They played without Davian Davis. I'm trying to think, was anyone else out on defense last week? I'm asking you for help here. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I, well, I did not realize that. No, not that I know of, not off the top of my head. I'd already went over to the offensive side of the ball and was thinking yeah. about, you know, uh, thinking about we haven't had Quincy Skinner. Uh, we're just now getting rotated. Rocco back. Haven't had Patrick Smith all year. Some of these guys that have been suspended, we, ha- we haven't had a chance to see. Uh, this team hasn't truly been healthy yet this year and they're still three and two so you know it is one i mean and look every one of these outcomes has basically been what was expected to the season i mean i expected to win in northern illinois so um we've won the games we were supposed to and lost the games we were expected to uh the way at least you saw a little bit of a battle alabama to me honestly chris the alabama game i am wiping the best i can to wipe clear out of my of my memory bank because it just looked too much like the old product, and I don't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, I, I'm, re- I'm ready for this game next week because while I was saying it is good to be able to get some of these guys healed up a little bit more, man, the only thing I want to do after a performance like that is show you that's not who we are. Let's get on the field. Let's play some football. And they got to wait another seven days for that. Well, and here's another thing. They also played without Xavier Castillo, who is – Arguably, right. arguably their best offensive lineman. Yeah, so yeah, that's that, that's a great point. And they've had to do some patchwork and on the offensive line as as well. We've had no running back depth at all. Uh, so yeah, yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm I don't have a decision on where this team is yet at all. I just know, like everybody else, I was extremely disappointed in the performance, not the outcome. We knew what that was but the performance that this team showed. Okay, I've got a half dozen questions in the mailbag. We've got about 35 minutes left. Those, a lot of times, hit on the things we're going to talk about anyway. So let's just go ahead and go there, and if if we've got anything left over to touch on after we're done, then I'll let you have the floor to, to bring up those things, if that's cool. Sounds great. Let's go for it. Okay, our mailbag is presented by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, please call Taylor or Russell, that number, 615-846-6200, see what your rights are and if they can help. Harley Hogg 44 asks, is Vanderbilt better, worse, or about what you expected? Uh, 
a little bit better than about what I expected. I know that's not one of my options, but that's where I would classify them as slightly better uh, than what I expected. I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I know that's not one of the options he gave me, but if I can adequately tell you exactly where I think they are, that would be about it. You know, I mean, I've seen some things. I've just seen things out of this out of this team this year that we know for certain Chris Chris Lee would never have been able to take place last year, no matter what. They just it, right. Yeah, uh, I'll give you an example. The, the the coming from behind in the cab, they they would they couldn't have done that. They just they just wouldn't have. You know, and you know having Raymond Davis this year is, you know. I mean, last year when he went down just immediately, that 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 put us uh, a big fat emergency break on the offense anyway. Uh, so you can definitely tell the difference uh, that he makes on this football team clearly. Uh, and it's going to be much better having some of that depth so we don't have to run him into the ground. Uh, but yeah, th- this this team's better than they were last year. So it's sl- slightly better than I expected. Mr. Vandy asks... What has impressed you the most from the team so far, and what is the biggest disappointment to this point of the season? Mm, What has impressed me so far? Um, Well, I'll I'll say this to you. Uh, Even though we had the quarterback situation that we had, uh, just I guess the sheer amount of offense, excluding last week in Tuscaloosa, you know, going into the fifth game of the season, this team's lowest output point wise was 25 points. And that was against a ranked team. You know, we, I mean, I always think about this, Chris, how many years have we just sat there and you just like this team can't even get past midfield against anybody. This is terrible. It's boring to watch. It's the same old, same old. This offense is generally pretty creative. Uh, this year they mix it up their play calling for sure. And, and now that they're getting some people back, maybe get more of those people involved. Uh, this team is fun to watch offensively. So uh, that, uh, that, that in itself is, is a big bonus for me because it's been a while since we've seen the team, you know, even James Franklin's teams. Uh, and we were, they were, they were very good sometimes. I don't know, especially through the air. I guess. Yeah, they they were not they were not the most exciting teams to watch. Like I, I think back to like the oh you know the the two bowl wins and and they just didn't do anything through the air really. I mean, other than down in Birmingham, just get the ball to Jordan Matthews and let him do his thing. But you're right. I mean, as good as those teams were, it was more defense and just don't make mistakes. This is yeah. Really, one of the best, and I think that's that's an interesting thing. And, and sorry to interrupt you here, but I, I think you're making a good point, no, and I wanted right. to expand on it. Um, you know, Clark Lee is a defensive minded coach, and, and yes, I get that the the performances have come against Elon and Hawaii, and, and Wake's defense is not the strength of its team. But man, for the most part, they couldn't score anything against anybody. Um, and and now they're putting up points. They, like you said, are, are interesting to watch. There's some creativity in play calling. Again, I think that everybody thought that Clark Lee, being a defensive-minded coach and, and what he did at Notre Dame, everybody kind of figured that like if they were going to be good on one side of the ball, it would be that. And, and right now, that's a talent thing. But the, the fact that they can flash something on offense after just kind of wandering through the wilderness there for the better part of the last decade or so to, to me is encouraging because I do think that with the pass rush and some improved speed, that defense is going to look a lot different in a couple of years. Well, I mean, it hit better, but you know what I mean? Yeah. The first thing that you said right there is what I was going to mention next is that, that it just, if we want to become a better football team, we have to find the pass rush. Just, I mean, Chris, there's no way around it. You know, I mean, you, 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 you can't really compete without it. Not really. And unless you are superior on the other side of the football, and we're not, we're, we're adequate on the other side of the football. So we got to get pass rush, you know, and I tell you, you know, this, this young man has had such a good season so far, you know, doesn't it seem like literally Anthony Orgy is in on every single play without fail. I don't care if it's 40 yards yeah. downfield, uh, in the backfield, sideline to sideline, that young man, and he never stops. 
You know, he's he is really. I've already liked him as a player, Chris, but he has really endeared himself to me. I just, I just, I just. I mean, to me, he is absolutely an NFL football player. I want to ask you something. I, I feel like I'm crazy. I mentioned That's after right. the game, I, I thought that he played fairly well against Alabama. There are, let's see, 44 guys played offense and defense against Alabama. He was the worst graded kid on the team in that game by pro football focus. Hey man, I don't care. I, don't I, I, I did. I didn't see a terrible game out of Anthony Orgy against Alabama, and I agree with you. I think he's yeah, been a really, minute. really nice player for them this year, and I agree. I think he is. He is making himself, in my mind, into an NFL draft pick. Yeah. What level? I don't know. You know, as, as far as what you know, where he's looked at, projected, round wise, I don't know. But the kid's an NFL football player. That's all I know, and I don't care what. PF. I mean, look, they broke down every play he did. So, you know, obviously they didn't just throw a number out there using darts. It doesn't matter to me. I've watched the guy every game he's ever played there. And the dude is just getting better every week and is a playmaker. And our defense would be absolutely nowhere without him. The next question, let's see. This is, this is a good one. This may be the best one in the mailbag. The best one in the mailbag. Well, I don't know if it's the best, but it is It is certainly the one maybe the most interesting. Dwarfan6 asked, do you think A.J. Swan could be better than Jay Cutler? <laughs> that, that's, oh, and that, that, that is a lot of projection. And I would say, okay, you mean a better college quarterback or you mean better – body of everything because I think that that, let's be real here Jay Cutler was a starting quarterback in NFL for what 10 years which I think is a very underrated accomplishment Jay always got judged by what he wasn't A. Jay never played on a great offense Uh, and B I just think being an average NFL quarterback for that long that's hard to do there aren't a lot of guys that have done that I mean a lot of first round draft picks who didn't start more than a year or two. Yeah, yeah. No, so no, I, I, I think I. This. All right. Well, I, I think I think probably my inclination is that's not a good bet. That saying career Swan's going to be better than Cutler. I, I begin. I just think it, I think it's very hard to play as long in the league as he did. But college, I mean. That's that. That's kind of where I want to focus this, but you can go where you want. I'm going to take, and and there, there might be a bunch of people that totally disagree with me on this, but I watched every game he played just like all of you did too. Uh, and I remember them. I'll, I'll just say this. The answer is yes and no. You know, and here goes another fence straddling answer, but here it is. Here's Here's why yes. Okay. Here's why yes for AJ because uh, he has a he his his arm is just insane. I mean, the, and he, w- the guy's a true freshman. He's just there's the capacity for that arm is limitless. I mean, he he's I, he has a real arm, and he also plays the game, Chris. And you notice this? I I mean, of course you were there in practice, but I watched this guy in the game, and for the most part. It sure as heck doesn't look to the moment too big for him. He looked like he's been ready and groomed and waiting to start for a year, like he had had a year, only he didn't. And I know he got there in the spring. I understand all of that. But he looked ready to come in. And his first start, he goes on the road, throws four touchdowns, no interceptions, uh, and, and just looked like he was ready. Uh, that's one of the reasons, yes. Here's another reason, reason why, yes. Jay Cutler now, and here's where I think a lot of you may disagree with me, who I love, still do. One of my favorite Commodores of all time. But for my money, when I evaluated Jay, there was something, there's something that happened that I felt like was pretty consistent. And I don't know if you'll agree with me on this. Thing about Jay was, and he was a hell of a competitor, there's no doubt. But if he started out slow, didn't get some completions going on early, did not get into an early rhythm, the era that I remember with Jay Cutler is, then that's the way it was going to be the whole game. That rhythm never came. 
if he started out with a great drive, you know, connecting all some dots, making some things happen here and there, and get let let him get locked into that game, he was in it to win it the whole time, and you were never getting him out. That's the way that I remember Jay Cutler as the quarterback for Vanderbilt. I don't think that's ever going to be the issue for A.J. Swan. I think he's always going to be engaged in the game, regardless of what, what what's going. Of course, it's very early. It was only a second start, but that's what I see so far. Uh, but that is why, if I were to say that he has a chance to be better than Jay, uh, that would be the case. Now, Jake, overall, as a complete quarterback, especially with the mobility, uh, I mean, he's just a better athlete, you know, you know and, and maybe a little bit more savvy. But I know what I saw, and I think that's something that we're not going to have to deal with with AJ. This season of the Vandy Sports Podcast has been made possible by my friend, Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. When it comes to general or cosmetic dentistry services, Jody is the best in Nashville. Just check out his client list. It testifies to that. He sees movie stars, music stars, athletes, coaches, you name it. Jody is the dentist of choice for stars in Nashville, but he sees regular folks like you and I as well. What people love about Jody's office is the ambiance. It's relaxing. It's friendly. Someone described it to me as a tooth spa. Whether your needs are general or cosmetic, go see Jody today. Call him 615-270-2322. See him at 55 Music Square East, not far from downtown or the Vanderbilt campus. Jody is a former Vanderbilt football player and a huge Commodore booster, so go and talk Vandy sports with him while you're there. Go see Jody Jones today. Thank him for his support of this podcast because without it, this season would not be possible. Yeah, I think that Swan's development, and look, we are just a few games into his career, so I I think you've got to temper any thoughts with that. But my concern, because you heard my practice reports or, or read them, was that he was going to throw a lot of picks. But yeah. he talked about with the media about making some adjustments, not trying to force things. We really have not seen that in games so much. That That is one of the comparisons with Cutler. I mean, there, there are just so many similarities from the arm, the build. Jay, as you said, is more athletic. And so I don't think that's a side of upside to Cutler that I think A.J. Swan's just not going to reach. He just He's not a concrete-footed quarterback, but he's not Cutler in terms of mobility. But – you know, if if AJ Swan can learn not to make the the forced throws that Jay made a lot of his career, and what we're seeing on the field is real progress and not just a short sample size, then I think you have to be encouraged. I mean, the accuracy right away I think is a little better than Jay's was. And remember, Jay didn't play that that first year on campus. He redshirted. So yeah. Swan is doing this, um, I don't know about by age, I don't know what the birthday comparison would be between the two, because sometimes you get a, you know, an older freshman, even as a true freshman. But, but in terms of year of development, A.J. Swan is doing this as a true freshman, whereas Jay Cutler didn't play as a true freshman. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's certainly uh, cer- certainly something to factor in there. But so, yeah, well, like I said, I think the potential is certainly there. I mean, there's a ton of similarities, but it's just the, the few things that they are different in that give me pause. Estelle 3 asks, what can they do more to pass to the tight ends? They may be the best unused weapons. Boy, <laughs> right, Chris? I mean, let me think about this for a second. Because, I, I mean, they've done a great job at blocking so far. I think we'd both agree with that, right? I mean, in the blocking role, yeah. they, 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 they've done their thing. Man, Chris, I, I'm trying to come up with something, but I, I don't think it's a – it's an inability to get open. I, I just think right now, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think that they are locked in on 14 and 16. And yeah. if somebody else gets something, we'll see what we can do. We know we got good blocking tight ends. Um, 
I just think this offense has been built around those two in that in that passing game, and then the rest of it basically around Ramon, uh, Raymond Davis. Uh, I don't necessarily know if it's something that the tight ends are not doing or that they're not getting separation on routes, uh, but I would love to have them. I mean, v- Vanderbilt, one of the positions that they should always should be seem, should be pretty well stocked in is tight end. And of course, I know you love Cole Spence. I, you know, he's so young in his development, but I just think they're locked in on other guys right now, Chris. Maybe I, maybe I'm wrong about that, and you see something different. I, I, I'm, I, I'm just saying. I think possibly it's probably there. They just haven't really looked for that. Is that what you see? Yeah, you answered that almost exactly the way I would have. I would, I would add a couple things to it. I mean, first of all. If you're picking a team MVP, five games in, it's Will Shepard, right? Sure. I mean, you heard Nick Saban after the game say, we didn't want to let 14 beat us or however he put it. That was the only guy they seemed to be really concerned with. McGowan, not not that he is in the same role as the tight ends, but we talked about Vanderbilt needing easy throws, right, in the playbook. Yeah. Well. With McGowan, you've got that. You've either got the end around, or if you want to make that into a shovel pass, that's an easy throw. If you want to throw a little out to him or something like that, you know, he took one against Wake that was, I think, a short throw and turned into 50 yards. Your tight ends, a lot of times, are those easier, shorter throws. So you've got a guy who gives you that dynamic, although it's, it's completely different. He's a speedy receiver instead of a bigger tight end. I think as much as anything that explains it, and you've also got Quincy Skinner who, you know, I, I, I don't want to make a a premature proclamation because talent's overrated and results are what you're looking for. But Quincy Skinner at times, to me in camp, looked like he was maybe as gifted as a receiver as they had. Now, we've got to see it consistently, and again, that means nothing till you see it in games. But they've got... Another option there, Gamarian Carter's got some talent. I think that it's just the the other options and Shepard and McGowan particularly being able to turn that into performance that's kind of squeezed those guys out a bit. Yeah, I mean, that's just how I see it. I mean, I would love, Chris, I, I, we both would. I mean, we got good tight ends. That's the thing. We've got good tight ends. We do. I would like to see them and get involved more in the passing game myself, for sure. I, I agree with that. Go Doors 94 says, what are the best opportunities to get a conference win and how many conference wins are you expecting? Expecting? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that Kentucky, or excuse me, that, uh, that Auburn Missouri game was a painful thing. Missouri had to come up with extremely creative uh, and difficult ways to lose a football game, but they pulled it off. They did it. Uh, now nobody's going to mistake Auburn for the former national champions, uh, but Missouri's just not a very good football team. I mean, I, I, they're they're a team who I envision, yeah. Maybe it's a track meet, but you tell me why Vanderbilt can't move the football on Missouri. Uh, they should be able to move the football on Missouri. They should be able to move the football on South Carolina. It's going to be the same names you know, but I'm going to give you another one. I'm going to give you another one out there because I, 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 I'll be honest with you. I know that Kentucky played a close game in Illinois, and I know that Ole Miss played a, uh, a close game last week in Oxford with a, a feisty Tulsa team. But both of those teams are definitely better than Vanderbilt. You're not going to argue that with me. That'd be silly. Correct. Uh, they're not beating Tennessee. They're not beating Tennessee. Tennessee is really good. Tennessee, Tennessee is an too. awful matchup for them stylistically. They uh, it, it 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 just is, and I can't. Man, ugh, it makes me sick. But uh, they don't match up with that team at all. They're not winning any of those games. 
But then there is that one other game that I, I think is in Nashville, if I remember correctly, uh, which, by the way, the South Carolina game is in, in uh, Nashville, and I'll see you there, Chris Lee, on November the 5th. Um, but you know, I know what we saw last week in Neyland Stadium, and I felt like that was a lot of that had to do with Tennessee more than it did, not more than it did Florida, but every bit as much. Uh, they let a guy who hadn't thrown a touchdown pass all year pick them apart through the air at key times. You know, but this is a this is an all right Florida team. That's not one of those vaunted Florida defenses. Uh, that's that that's the same Florida team who had to hold on to a three point win at home against a South Florida team who'd won one game the year before. You know, and I know you can bring up the Utah win and it was impressive. It was fine, but I'm here to tell you Florida. And that, that may not be the case soon because I think that they have themselves a, a legit football coach. I, I, I think that uh, they'll get that turned around sooner than later, but they're susceptible still. This would be a win of, especially with Vanderbilt's ability to move the football, you know, I can see a scenario and nobody's going to agree with me on this. Maybe we get beat 58 to seven, but I can see a scenario in which they could beat Florida and, and, and Nashville. So the game, how many games am I expecting? I'm not expecting a conference win until I see it, but how many games do I think they could possibly win if they played uh, their Supreme game? Uh, three, Missouri, Missouri, South Carolina, and Florida. Don't know if they'll win any of them, but those are th- th- three games that they're capable of winning. I'm really interested to watch how things go down at Missouri. George is going to beat the tar out of Missouri today, probably. We're doing this Saturday morning. That game will you'll you'll probably have seen the score by the time you hear the podcast. Missouri's got Luther Burden, which it landed through an NIL deal, and he is not getting the ball. And he was the best receiver in the country, and elite wide receivers who don't get the ball, and I don't know what, I'm not saying this is or isn't a problem. I don't know Luther Burden. I don't know the situation, but I look at that and I say that's something that could blow up on them quickly. Uh, Then they go to Florida. I think Florida, by they, I mean Missouri. I think Florida is the biggest wild card in the East, maybe in the league, because I think how, how Richardson goes is how that team goes. And you've seen that go in very different directions for him so far. I don't know if the Tennessee game was an aberration or if it's if it's what's to come. If it's what's to come, forget Florida. They're not going to beat Florida. But if you see the, the kid that played the, the few games before that, I agree with you. They've got a chance, although it's, it's a slim chance. It's everything's got to go right, and I would much prefer – to play Florida sooner than later. I've said that all year. And and that thing on the back end of the schedule makes me think that is a that's a long shot, but maybe not as big of a long shot as we thought because of all those variables. South Carolina, Carolina has had a hex on them that defies explanation. Well, I mean, mostly. Most years, South Carolina is better. But like you've seen some years, like the Sean Elliott team was not better than that Vanderbilt team and still won that game. Uh, they they cannot beat South Carolina for whatever reason. I haven't done it since the the Jared Cook game in what oh seven or oh eight. But Rattler is not the guy that was the guy at Oklahoma coming into last season. He threw two picks against South Carolina State. That is not a team that is dominant in the trenches. Uh, I think Carolina's got more team speed, and that's a concern. But there there are some games here that just based on what we have seen, you can concoct a scenario where they're in the game and and maybe sneak one out late based on what we've seen from Vanderbilt and from those teams. Right. Yeah, we're on the same page. I think think we're on the same page here for sure. Okay, this will be the last one. It goes very well for you, by the way. Well, I mean, it beats beats what I've covered for – the last few years. Yes, Dan, bro. Well, you just you just wanted to be interesting, right? Yes, absolutely, man. That's where I'm at with it right now. 
I mean, I've, I've covered, think about this, and this will this will bleed into the next question too. I've covered, what, the last four years, the longest losing streak in SEC basketball history in the league, and a, a one in football now that sits at 22. I don't remember what the the record for consecutive conference losses is, but I think they're getting close. Right. Well, you know, the good news is for you, you're not alone in this. We we bleed with you. <laughs> so uh, we, we know exactly how you're feeling. Well, there's just there's just not many of you. Um and that and that's the issue. And that's gonna that's gonna that's gonna get touched on in the next question, I think, in a roundabout way. This is the last one of the mailbag. Here we go. Yeah, well, this this could take an hour, but we're not going to do that. Vandy Gal seventy eight from the people. What's that? I said it won't. I promise. (laughs) Yeah, Vandy Gal seventy eight from people you talk to. Do you have indication that any indication that former VU football fans that showed up during the Franklin years are starting to get interested in what is happening in the program, or is it still a wait and see for most? Well, uh, unfortunately, where I live, there aren't other Vanderbilt fans. So I don't, I don't tell, I, my, my interaction with Vanderbilt fans is with you guys uh, doing this because we don't have them. Uh, the people that I talk to who talk about Vanderbilt, uh, they do, they do, they, they do say kind of the same thing. They're like, you know, you, you, Vanderbilt a tougher team they they see that clark lee is heading them in the right direction that they'll be a team that you have to work you have to beat that's going to give you he's not going to bowl them over that you're going to have to work but they have no fear of them chris they 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 don't have any fear they don't think that uh they don't they don't think they're going to rise to a level to where the other teams in the arts conference are uh, talent wise, uh, facility wise. I mean, in this whole BS crap about checkerboard in that stadium and all this, you know, look to the rest of the fan base. So congratulations. You're all state schools. You know, uh, we, I'm sorry that we're the only small, the only private school in the Southeastern conference. You know, we're never going to have that fan base. It is what it is. It, there's nothing special that you did. This is what it is. Uh, and but if she's asking uh, just about the people who used to be there, you, this is and it's even now more than ever because it was like that then. But just think about now. You have to show it first. It can't be they're not willing to meet you in the middle. You know they're not. You have to do it. This team does things like beat Wake. You know beats Ole Miss on a Saturday. You know, wins these games, people will come back slowly but surely, especially if we see a lot of offense. If this team has fireworks and they put it up and you're winning games on TV and you're beating teams you're not supposed to beat, these fans will come back. But they're not going to do it and then uh, they're not going to come back and then see. You're going to have to earn them back, Chris. That's the only way this is going to happen because as you just out of your own mouth said, there's only a few of us. Uh, since, so since that's the case and, you know, especially this younger base, they're not going to put up with that. They don't have to, you know, they don't have that, that, that tie and that, that connects them for 40 years, the way it does for you and I, and a lot of people that listen to this cast, uh, to this podcast. So they've got to, they've got to do it first. So until the wins come and the bowl games come, the bowl wins come and these facilities get upgraded, you know, pictures are pretty, videos are nice. They want to see progress until you do that. There's not going to be a change. It's not about meeting anybody in the middle. It's you got to do all the legwork. You got to prove it. And if you do, we'll come back. That's the way I think that it is. Now I could be dead wrong about that, but I don't think so. No, you're you're not. I know multiple former players, and look, th- there are. Th- this is not a broad brush. There, there's always with any base of former players and fans. There's the ten or twenty percent that are always going to drink the Kool Aid. So th- throw those throw those guys out. The ones that I know that are more realistic, uh, I, and I've had several that have told me that they they say I'm embarrassed to wear my gear. Um, I think that the fan engagement, I know people that used to plan their Saturdays around Vanderbilt football, like uh, 
they they may not, they may get to Saturday and not even know who they're playing. May not watch a play. I mean, I, I know people like that now. Maybe they find out the score the next day. Maybe they find it out the next week. And I think that there are some pockets at Vanderbilt where they do a good job. I'll give you a for example because this is leading into a larger point. My wife took the kids, someone gave us tickets to the Elon game. And that's the first time my wife has ever gone to a game and taken both kids. I think she's, every couple years she'll go to a game and, and take one of the kids, but they've never, she's never gone and taken both. And they've not been beating down the door to go either. They went, and I think somewhere between the end of the first quarter, start of the second, my son David got sick and was just vomiting all over the place. Whoever was the usher, I think, in Section D, or the ushers, were tremendous. They came up, cleaned it up, said, can we help with anything? One of them followed them to or into the bathroom, said, can we help you out? Like, I have... I've cleaned up vomit before, not not in a metaphorical sense. I've done that too, but um, but in the actual sense, when you have young kids, you're going to be cleaning up vomit at some point, uh, and that that is not a fun job. And so they they had exceptional service from whoever was there. That that is above and beyond. And I, I do think that there are people over there affiliated with the school that are like that. They need a lot more of those guys. I, I think the the process for season ticket renewals and fan retention, if there's even one, it looks to me like it's awful. I, I've got stories from friends who showed up for games and their their tickets didn't exist anymore. Their seats had been moved without knowing. Uh, people will be season ticket holders for decades and give up their tickets, never get a call. Um. Yeah, you know, I've heard stories of people that have been fans for decades and you know, they've been the last ones to leave the stadium and we're told, you know, you're if you want to renew your seats, they are you know, a lot more next year and and by the way, the parking pass you used to get for this is now an absurd amount of money to renew. They have got to get a coherent strategy with ticketing and fan retention. I know they outsource some of their ticking. I get uh, ticketing. I get that. They had an issue a few weeks ago for the wake game, where they went all electronic ticketing. They had some kind of goof up uh, when people were trying to access their tickets electronically and get in the stadium, and people waited in line for a while and didn't get in until after the game was over. That that ticketing situation seems to be a mess. I get what they're. They're doing, I know the tickets compared to other places, they're sort of underpriced. I get that. I don't think they're underpriced when you're in a 22-game losing streak. Um, I didn't think the pricing decision was a good one at a time they need more interest. I, I don't see any coherent effort in terms of fan and ticket retention. I've said this for years. You've heard me say this. I bet I said this four or five years ago. If I'm them, I think one place where you can make an investment is an athletic department and reap huge benefits, not just financially, but emotionally. And and even just getting guys who who may not go for every game anymore just to have interest in the program and at least watch on TV. I think they need a first-class fan operation where you you hire customer service people from Disney or Chick-fil-A or somebody like that, and you start designing the whole fan experience from the top down um, through season ticket retention and those sort of things. And again, I, I'm not saying they haven't done some good things. Um, I think they've done some good things at time with tailgating. Um, I, I think they have done, like again, the, the experience at my – My family had a few weeks ago. They do good things in pockets. It is not consistent. And when you're getting your hat handed to you, um, on top of that, you've already got, you know, a hand tied behind your back with the state of the programs over there. You cannot afford to have another hand tied behind your back when you do not have a coherent experience to retain ticket holders and make their service first class. And again, I'm not saying they don't do it in pockets, but 
they have missed big opportunities there for years. No, the problem is there's so few fans left uh, that that I think some of them have just you know turned it off for good. But but maybe there's some yeah, you can yeah. win back, and and they needed to start doing that yesterday. And I don't see it from what I hear. Again, I am I'm a credentialed media member. I have not sat in the stands with with the ticket in like twenty something years. So I, I'm not the best guy, but I'm just going on based what I hear, and also the the, the lack of people in the stands. Yeah, uh, all that will I, I think all that because you're talking about cultivating a new base too as well, uh, not just trying to get the old uh, the old to come back or the ones that you used to have, but uh, you know, you, you got to concentrate on building a whole brand new base, and they can do that. You can do both at the same time. Uh, you can't afford to do neither. You know, and if you've, and I think you said the money's up to all close to 400 million on it. That's great. And it, it's important. But I would think uh, my question would be if you're going to put that much out there, then why half tail it? You know, you don't have to, that's a school that doesn't half tail do most things that they do. Why, why, why basically waste $400 million if you have no intentions, you know, not no real intentions of maximizing that thing as far as you can go. That's what I want to know. Also know the Ole Miss and Kentucky is about to kick off. Who you got in this one today? Um, I've got Ole Miss straight up. I've got Kentucky to, to beat the seven. Uh, I'm not betting on it, but if, if you want to know, I, I, I had one more thing I wanted to add here, if you don't mind. Um, the, the, the other thing that they've got to learn, and again, I, I think this is where this bleeds over into fan bases. People are not disposable. Um, again, there's been a feeling, and this is a cultural problem at Vanderbilt. If you are not one of those 30 or 40 donors that's got more money than they know what to do with historically, you've not been treated well by the school. I think that bleeds over into the way fans are treated. Again, you know, people that will go decades without renew, you know, with tickets. Um, you know, if, if they hear from the school, it's hey, your your tickets are doubled. Um, if they go away, they don't hear from the school. Um, you know, and, and I think that's extended into some other things. I mean, I know they made a change in PA announcer, and some of this is. Is personal because Steve Willard became a good friend of mine. Steve was a guy who loved Vanderbilt dearly. I thought did a really good job, especially on the baseball side. I thought he did great for football too. People can disagree. I don't know that people know this. Steve, Steve got some criticism for a while. Steve had a brain operation about two years ago and came back not long after that because he was dedicated to the job. I, I look back a few years, um, guys that I got to know in the press box, you know how I thought about the whole media relations thing and how much I really liked the Andy Boggses of the world's. Uh, Andrew Pate was probably the nicest human being who's ever worked at Vanderbilt. He got let go when that whole thing was a terrific baseball guy. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about the guys that are there now. Um, you go back to Brandon Barker. Brandon Barker would have given his right arm to stay at Vanderbilt. Didn't have to do much for him. Just give him a raise. Uh, maybe make it where he's not working 80-hour weeks or whatever he was putting in. But Brandon had a family and kids. And they, they just could have cared less. And again, some, some of this is a few years in the rearview mirror. Um, and so, you know, maybe you got new people in charge and things are different, but I see a chronic issue with Vanderbilt that's with the school, which is treating people as if they are disposable. That's, that's a bad culture issue they've got to fix. I think that bleeds over into ticketing. And I think that's where if they could blow that whole thing up and start over, Bring in some first class ticketing people. Heck, give Brandon give Brandon Barker a call. See if he'll come back and, and help you promote the school and 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 work and things like that. Because Brandon's Brandon's give a rip was off the charts. I saw the time that guy put in. This this whole thing with fans 
and everything is, is just part of a bigger cultural thing that, that in my mind maybe is the biggest thing left for the AD to it. Well, NIL would be the biggest thing. Um, but, you know, they're, they're at least doing improvements to the stadiums, I think those are going to be nice. We can talk about whether they're enough, and, and maybe that's fair, but they're going to be nice. But I think that that thing with, with treatment of people and fans is just the thing that has just been glaring for years that I still don't see getting touched across the board like it should. Again, there, there are good things in pockets that I see in here, not, not minimizing those things, but I mean a coherent thing with ticket holders and fans, and I think that's that's got to be the thing that when they when their feet hit the floor in Magugan on Monday, that that needs to be a topic. Yeah, I agree, man. I mean, no more half tailing it. Uh, get with it. You're either in or you're not. Uh, you know, it's uh, the SEC plays all in, no limit, right? They play no limit, all in poker. They don't play pot limit. We're playing pot limit right now. Got to get in an all in game. We're also seven minutes past the kickoff of, of Ole Miss in Kentucky, which I promised I'd have you out by. So, um, lonely, baby. With that, tell people where we can find you, and let's get out of here. You can find me at, at Cheap Seat Bass. That's going to be on Twitter. You can listen. And by the way now, Chris, they can watch the program live on Fire TV, Apple TV, Roku. Just go to WN, as in Nancy, WS.com. I do two shows a day, one in the morning. That's a variety show. At night, the Cheap Seats is all about sports. And you can find me on the dial here in Jackson on 101.5 FM. All right. He's Seabass. I'm Chris Lee. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next week with the Vandy Sports Podcast. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We thank our presenting sponsor, Jody Jones DDS. We thank our other sponsors, Sutherland and Belk and MyPerfectFranchise.net, as well as the Kendrick Group and Stakes. If you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, and that's how we make this work, please email me at chrislee70 at gmail.com. We also ask that you subscribe to our website, VandySports.com. That is $99 a year. You get things there that you don't get here. And, of course, please rate, review, and subscribe where you see our podcast. That helps us get noticed. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at VandySports.com. Follow me at ChrisLee70. And finally, subscribe to our Vandy Sports YouTube channel as well. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast, which is part of the 440 Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We'll catch you with another episode coming very soon.